Hey everyone. Thanks for taking the time hey on a everyone. Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for taking the time on a Friday uh, and thanks to Startup, Startup Exchange for letting me join you guys. It's one kind of upside of all these virtual meetings is that I can uh, attend a meeting in Atlanta that would be difficult under nor normal circumstances. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Paul Willard. I'm an engineer. I'll uh, always be an engineer. I, uh, Worked for about 10 years at Boeing as an aerodynamics engineer. So on the hard side, literally designing airplanes, some of the most complex hardware in the world. Before I went to Silicon Valley and started working at startups in 1999, I worked for about four startups over the next 15 years. Uh, Nextcard, Coupons.com, Practice Fusion, and NCN. Uh, and learned a lot from all four all, all four miraculously grew at just insane rates. Three of them ended up IPOing. And at the end of it all, the, the startups were so successful, not, not because I'm so amazing. I, I carried my part, but anybody who's ever been at a startup knows there's a whole team of people that need to carry their part of the load for a startup to be that successful and grow so quickly. And so the conclusion at the end when I became an investor was I must have been doing something to pick the company that I want to work for that was resulting in fast growing, very successful companies. So when I started as an investor in 2013, uh, the goal, my, my big top secret investment thesis to be successful was to invest in a company that I wanted to work for. And I, I took it quite literally and I went back and put my, lens on like I was looking for a job again and looking for a place to go to work. Uh, and, and that's how I made my investment. So far, so good, knock on wood. Don't wanna, don't wanna jinx my, uh, my luck to date, but you know, successfully was an early investor in Zipline, in Carta, in Boom Supersonic. Um, and, and so ho hopefully a bunch more that are gonna uh, get into the, that kind of realm and that kind of size as well. So um, putting down a frame, I'll run through the framework. Miraculously, when I wrote down my, the framework that I used just to document it so that we could tell investors uh, what our investment methodology was, it looked like a normal VC uh, investment framework. So the two are fairly aligned, although there's some personal effects of it that, uh, that I'll go into when I walk through. And so I was just going to walk you to look at what happens to be very, very similar to what almost every VC in the Valley uses uh, to some degree. So first and foremost, focus. When, when you're working for a startup, an important element of picking which startup to work for is you can only work for one. So you have to forego all of the others. And you have to be so excited about the one that you're willing to not go to any of the others. In fact, not even go to another that might come up in a year because really when you're working for a startup, you're just gonna be at that one for probably at least four years. But, and then second, what stage uh, do you like? And, and I'm an early kind of person, so uh, seed to series A kind of ballpark. And that worked for me as an operator and it works great for me as an investor as well now. And then finally sector. And so this, the sectors I've been interested in, interestingly, have changed slowly uh, over time. And so gradually, as markets has, have evolved, different sectors have become interesting to me. 
both markets are evolving and also I'm evolving too. Uh, and so it's the kind of those things. Bottom line is the place where I work, I spend a ton of time at and a ton of my and focus and mental are on. And so I want it to be something I'm really excited about. I want to feel like I'm doing something for the world. Um, and, and so I'm going to narrow my focus in my sectors. I also want to feel like it's an area where I can really contribute and where I can contribute maybe better than a lot of other people because I have maybe a specific domain knowledge that I can apply to that sector that will be super beneficial. And so as a result of that, uh, like right, right now, I'm very interested in enterprise. I'm very interested in robotics as a service and software as a service when it, uh, on automation particularly. The software sector investments for me more than hardware. Uh, I have some background in fintech, and so I've always liked fintech as well, and, and certainly things that fly. <laughs> um, there are a lot of other sectors and a lot of other investors, if I, if I back up. They each have their area of focus, too. And when it comes to a professional investor, not only is it their area of interest, their, their passion area, if you will, but um, also remember they have investors. And they went out to their investors, and they said, these are the sectors that I'm really good at that I'm really interested in. These are the ones where I have a good chance of being successful. And that's where I'm going to invest. And their investors put money in their funds expecting investments in those sectors. So if, if you're out looking for investors for a startup, it, one of, it is also one of the first filters that you should have is this investor in the sector. I'll, I'll a little bit later, but. Next, there's a concept in Silicon Valley called the power law. You probably know it, but the idea is that if you invest in a portfolio, let's say 20 different early startups, that one is going to be so much more successful than the others that it's probably going to be worth more than all the rest of them put together. It might be worth 10 times more than all the rest of them put together because one tends to run away. And so I always have in my head that I want to find those power law outliers that are going to grow very fast. I want the top line capability for what they're after to be at least a hundred million or more. And I, I, I mentioned on here, some funds are looking for 500 million or more. So some of the larger funds that are really looking to deploy a lot of capital are looking for really, really significant opportunities to invest in. Um, and then as far as coming out of the gates fast, like the dream benchmark, and I think it's, I think it's Jason Lemkins over at Saster who said it first, although, although plenty of people have been thinking it for a while, but uh, zero to two million run rate in the first 12 months that the product's out. And you may spend some time building the product before you launch it, but that's a fast launch. That's a fast launch. And then after that, the company you're looking for is, is the rule of thumb, triple, triple, double, double, double. And if you start at that $2 million uh, run rate mark, revenue mark, and you triple it the next year, you're at six, triple it again, you're at 18, double it 36, double it 72, double it again, you're at $144 million in six years. That is an insanely fast path to $144 million. But the very best for law companies follow a path similar to that. And so, it's, it's got to be in the head, at least, that there's a possibility that this is one of those companies. Hopefully, a, a strong possibility. The next four kind of categories, I think, are classic. And in the investing world, they're called the four T's. So Team TAM, uh, Total Addressable Market, is TAM. Tech and Traction, and I'll go in. They're important enough. I'll go into each of them in a little bit of detail. So on the team front, there's an old Silicon Valley saying that you want the people that you work with on the team to be somebody that you can enjoy going and having a beer with after work. And I never liked that one. It never set well with me for a few reasons. Um, the, the main one being I had lots of people that I really loved working with that I thought were great, great, great at their jobs that I don't think I ever went and had a beer with. <laughs> and so some of them maybe didn't drink, some of them had uh, kids and maybe young 
time in my life was more important time that we were working together than going here with me, which I totally understand and relate to. Um, maybe some of them had a long commute and the last thing they wanted to do before that long drive was go out and have a beer before they hit the road. Um, whatever the reason, I kind of didn't care. I just never liked that one. Um, but I always did really like going to work. And much as I enjoy the weekends with my family, uh, I, I always loved Monday morning, you know, getting going, going to that first startup, and maybe the only startup when I was operating, but and and going to work. And I was always pretty happy about going into the office and, and starting to work. Or now starting to work at home. I'm still pretty pretty happy Monday morning when I get to go back to work. Um, and so my rule for people that I work with was always that if I open the door to the office and right behind the door, here's the first person I see on Monday morning when I'm already happy, I'm in my good happy place getting ready to go to work. Am I now even more excited about going to work and walking in there and working with this person? Or did my momentum just drop a little bit? Did my enthusiasm decrease? And if, if it's the latter, it's probably not somebody that I want to spend so many hours of my work life with. And uh, also, also a company I probably don't want to uh, invest in because I'm going to spend. So it's really important to me to be excited about working together. And it encompasses a few things, smarts, hard work, most important of all, though, execution. So in a startup, execution is everything. Uh, you need to be smart enough you need to be the best on the execution front within a category to win. And so I definitely value being able to look at and see somebody's successful execution in their experience. It could be at college. It could be in projects. It could be at a company similar or dissimilar to the one that uh, I'm going to or, or considering going to work for. Um, on the co-founder front, like rules, rule of thumb would be two to three co-founders. One tends to be, well, it tends to be problematic and especially there's a key person risk. Uh, and if you get more than three, consensus tends to start getting difficult and Anything other than consensus can get difficult. Two is really the classic, uh, but I do see three more and more. The technical, co for me anyway, technical co-founder is a very important one. It's probably be because I'm an engineer. It's not for every investor, uh, but it is for a lot. Um, and particularly investors with a technical background, I think it's common that the technical co-founder is a key thing. There's also like, there's sayings in Silicon Valley like that the co-founder can't hire somebody technically stronger than themselves. Don't get me wrong. You can, you, you can and should hire people yourselves in a sector, but just overall global technically, I think the adage comes from the idea that somebody really strong isn't going to be super excited about reporting to somebody that they th think is maybe not as them technically. But regardless, you, you want a very strong technical co-founder and particularly somebody who's strong in that area that you're uh, gonna pursue at a startup. And I'll, I'll talk about that a second later. But on the reality discussion field is real and companies really helps them raise, but it also with sales, helps them with acquisition because uh, a founder with a strong reality distortion field, so to speak, is a, is a good PR founder as well and a good uh, voice for the company. Uh, reality distortion field, uh, one of Steve Jobs' employees, I think, coined the term back when about his ability to bring everybody else to see the world the way he does, even though that might be different than how everybody else looked at the world when they're not in his presence. Um, and then finally, you know, the investors. And I count the investors on the team because a good investor is involved. And so I, I want to know who the investor team is for that startup as well. Uh, and if those are people that I'm going to enjoy working with also uh, and trust. The TAM is the next one, total addressable market. First big and defensible. I think, oh, no. Can't hear me? Still? All right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So big and defensible. I think I addressed big before. Uh, 
the defensible part, there's two main defensibility that you hear. And uh, one is sort of the classic one, if you will, is strong brand and integrations. So just to talk about those, a strong brand makes customer acquisition less expensive and easier for you than everybody else around you. And whoever gets the best distribution wins by default. I used to pick on Microsoft on this one and say that WordPerfect you know, was better than Microsoft Word, but Microsoft had incredible distribution and the product was good enough. And so they won. And so a great brand will make your distribution easier and more effective than all your competitors would you win. Integrations, integrations originally, the idea originally came from, from SaaS, I think, in terms of using them to, uh, to prevent attrition, if you will. But it's, it's really about broadening the value proposition to more than just your original buyer, if that makes sense. So if I have a piece of software that the IT team loves, that's great. The IT team buys, they get the software into the building. Now, if I have an integration that makes finances life easy because the IT team is using, I have an integration to finance. Now, I have another option that the developer's lives easy because it integrates the automated system. I mean, generally, if I could get up to different integrations where I'm showing real value, now, if you wanted to swap me out for, say, editor, you might not be able to swap me out with just one. In fact, it's very likely that you could swap me out with a single product that happens to have all the exact same integrations that I do. Uh, and so, at, at very least, we've made it so you have to swap me out for three products instead of one. Uh, and at very best, it just might look so painful that people say, forget it. It's, there's, <laughs> we're, we're doing a good enough job with this. Let's not think about switching at all. And, and that's the goal. And so brand and integrations is sort of classic defensibility on both the customer acquisition as well as the retention side, uh, retention or lack of attrition, however you want to look at it. And then, well, we'll uh, in fact, winner take all models, link classic first example of this. And I, you know, I'm not going to be able to describe it better than Reed Hoffman. So if you really want to learn about this model, go, go, go listen to him talking about it, especially in the old days, or look at his old deck um, at LinkedIn. But more, more value every net came before. Ooh, that's generally a winner take all model. So if you get that brand and integration side model is typically the winner gets percent of the market the second place person gets 20 percent third place gets eight percent and uh a fourth something to two that, that's sort of a classic model and there are reasons that markets like to evolve that way but once you get locked into that uh market position it's it's hard to take for anybody to take you out or, or to, to trade your position or swap your position with you and I can point to examples like Bing trying to win a uh, search engine market. And they, they may have caught Yahoo after spending billions and billions of dollars, but I, they never even came close to Google locked in on that first spot. But, and then there's lots of other examples. I think I even have a talk about this on Rock Health somewhere from way back when. But um, another aspect of the market is willingness to buy. And so your ideal market has a customer that's willing to buy. I know that sounds obvious, but there's, there's a difference between a customer leaning in and looking for a product and a customer that you have to convince that they have a problem that needs to be solved. And so a willing to buy, the, the most willing to buy customer has a real problem that they know. It's one of their top five, so it's worthy of their attention. And when they see the solution to it, you know, they're gonna get some so-called pain relief. Pain pills, not vitamins is the adage. And there's, you, you can look up that, uh, analogy, uh, if, if you like, as far as how it uh, applies to startups. So a customer that's willing to buy and preferably fast. Sometimes there are great customers, and, but they take years to get through committee and finally sign a contract, or, or they take long pilots, huge pilots with long uh, value proposition sort of time horizons before they buy. And so another aspect is market concentration. It's not just market con concentration uh, for the market that you're going into. 
it's actually concentration in sort of the classic quarter forces strategy kind of approach. And so I, I like to look at market concentration of the suppliers to the product for comp competitively with for the product itself and then for the buyers of the product. And if in any of those places there are only three people and they're giants that are dominating, it can be difficult to move value chain uh, between one spot and the next. And so it's, it's worthy of looking at. The final is they don't make it. I'm sure you've seen the technology and curves and, and I, you want to get in past the trough of disillusionment because a lot of startups maybe won't have the financing to survive the trough of disillusionment. So it's nice to jump in on a wave that's already there uh, where you don't have to make it and you don't have to survive the market eventually getting there. Tech, a few aspects of the technology being used by a startup that I think about anyway. One of the most important is why now? Um, technology application in terms of building and build businesses, in my head, is very evolutionary. There are things like we're standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before, we believe. Uh, turtles all the way down is another one if, if you want fun things to Google. <laughs> but the bottom line is that I think most of the time the technologies that are particularly exciting now, like robotics as a service right now, for me, is in a, a, a spectacular time frame because mobile phones advanced all kinds of sensor technology and lithium ion batteries came from laptops. And when you start to smash those together with really nice motors that Tesla maybe helped us get to, then three of those things can be used to build all kinds of exciting stuff. Sounds very incremental when I build up to it that way. And that's so that's sort of how I like to think about the world. If we had to wait for any one of those three areas to evolve before the of the tech D was low enough to build a fast growing startup, then it might take too long to evolve, be able to grow and fast like I was talking about before. Hard enough to, is an interesting one. If something's too easy, you get 20 people that try to it and if they can have a good enough product because it really is too easy then uh, often you'll just get prices running down uh, because everybody will have already spent the money they spent to build the product and they'll just be lowering prices to capture as much market as they can in that kind of competitive if it's too hard too long to develop and I think I just thought that on the line now enough but when you have something that's right, again, like robotics as a service today, there are a handful of people in the world that are really, really strong roboticists. And those people can build a new robotics company really quickly. Uh, and it, it doesn't take them as much capital as everybody else either. And so th they make it look easy. It's actually really hard still, but for them, they can do it. <laughs> and so that's a hard enough problem that for the other people that are like them that can do it, they'll look around and they'll go, oh, I know that person. They're a really good roboticist and they're already doing that market. I'll just go find another one. There's a bunch of other markets where there aren't, is not a really world-class roboticist in there yet. And I know it's on those markets. I'd rather do that than compete against this one. And likewise, they make it, they make it look easy, but, uh, but, but it's not. It's hard work, even for those most talented folks in the world, and that they're executing. Execution is everything, again. Um, I look at selling versus renting, so I prefer SaaS or RAS uh, business models, uh, and I get better multiples and are more. I'm looking at as opposed to things that people will really sell. And on, on the IP front, I just... Sometimes I see technologies that are clearly licensing business models, and it's not what I personally look for. It seems to us out there that are actively looking for that. But for me, I'm looking for a company that's best served with a licensing business model. On the traction front, I, I talked about 2 million revenue 12 months after launch a little while before, uh, plus product market fit, and people have probably heard that term before, but knowing who your buyer is and why they're buying and consistently selling to the same buyer for the same reason 
is a great place to be for a company you know that's out looking for a Series A. Uh, for a seed, it's rare to get too much product market fit yet, of course. And then go to market fit is the next step. So any signs of go to market fit already being there, and that's the ability to sell and get to market and get distribution efficiently, so that you're making more money than you're spending to uh, sell it. And then finally, there's this idea of cap efficiency and traction. So this is to use my two million dollar benchmark again for run rate. How much did it? How much capital did it take to get you to that two million dollar revenue? If it took you $2 million or less, great. If it took you more than $2 million to get to, of, of investment to get to $2 million of revenue, uh, then I started looking a little bit closely and see maybe you spent some capital in an area that you ended up sort of pivoting away from or didn't pan out and dollars that you're in. I like that better. That's the kind of thing that you're looking for on the area or the thing that I'm looking for uh, in terms of capital efficiency. So, so that's the objective area, by the way. And literally we'll make a Franklin list, you know, pluses and minuses run. And I believe all of those criteria list. I, I, I keep writing it down, plus it in my own hand, through all piece of paper. I, I made it in my memory better if I wrote with an ink. You know, I wrote it down. Then I would make another hand on a piece. I would write Franklin that with this company versus either all the competitors or all the other companies that I was other considering going to work for, or historical, consider a historical company that I did really well with. Uh, and I wanted to compare and see how this sort of measured up that. Uh, then find a confidant who have a lot of trust in, and I give them the job of being a devil's advocate. And so I told them specifically, I don't want to know if you like this company. I don't want to know if you like this space. All I want you to do is shoot holes at it. I want you to just tear up. I'm going to give you my evaluation. I'm going to walk through my Ben Franklin's with you and why. And I want you to tell me why I'm wrong and, and tell me why I've overhyped this or overvalued it or overstated it. And so this is one of my reality capturing devices. My next step in my process is to take those pieces of paper with the Ben Franklins and everything else on them and tear them up. And when they were on paper, I would literally tear up handwritten pieces of paper, walk over to the trash can, throw them in there. I like to do that in an afternoon. And then I wanted to sleep on it, typically for, for like two nights, right? Now, there's this idea that the subconscious is the mind and the conscious brain. And so my goal here was to do that. And to get into a space where, okay, I've evaluated I've it consciously, um, criteria. Now I just want to see that hit fits and deep on it. And there's an idea. It's, it's a, there are some people who believe that your brain is actually an entangled quantum computer that can see the future, but that the part of your brain that can do that is your subconscious. So whether that's true or not, I really don't care. But I, I'm imagining in my head that I have what I want to think of because they say that the, the part that the future see if what they see is emotional, either trauma or happiness. And so I want to think about me and this company and can I see big happiness, big serotonin release in the future with me and this company? And only if I can get myself to where intuitively I can see that uh, will I eventually pull the trigger and end up going there. And so, you know, I, I, I just call it being honestly, I'm, I'm trying to gauge my intuition and my subconscious so that I can be lucky because I think anybody who does well investing in early stage startups is got to be lucky. <laughs> and so I just want to give myself the chance to be honestly. And, and so, that's what makes me an investor not at the end of the day. The, my most recent exercise of this, actually, it was a robotics as a service company called Zippity. Uh, don't tweet it. I haven't announced it yet, actually. It's so, but uh, I run through all the criteria that I just ran through with you, and, and Zippity just hit every single one. And I see a happy my team, and I see a lot of, yeah, thanks, Vishal. I see a lot of years happy working together. <laughs> Words. 
reason for doing this, and then I'll, and we can go for it. But uh, I always tell people just to get a Google Sheet and start making a list of potential investors, and then typically go into space or some similar uh, database and find people people that invest at a similar stage and sector first, just names of firms, and get them listed down. And typically, if I go find a bunch of companies in a sim and, and I go back and I look at who invested in them uh, at the same stage, I'll end up getting the names of some firms or some investors five, six, seven times because they're clearly leaning into that sector at that stage. And so those will, will naturally rise to the top of my list. Uh, next, I go look at anything that might be considered competitive and, of course, find the investors and cross them off the list. Um, and then I go to the companies that aren't crossed off and the ones that are left, and I start trying to find somebody to refer me and introduce me to the people in those companies. And so that's sort of the, the standard process for me. Um, I, to me, none of this is magic, but I've been doing it a long time, and I recognize that. And when I was operating venture capital, uh, was opaque and nobody told what they were doing and how they were going about doing it. So I always said that uh, when I became an investor, I, I told myself that I would always try to be as transparent as possible. And as simplistic as this might sound, I, I don't know how I can be any more transparent about how I evaluate a startup. I literally have a template document that runs through every single one of these as just an outline. It's really that straight for me if I go about it. And so hope that seeing see inside that process, uh, transparent there, is helpful to everybody. <laughs> My ISP. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I, I'll look down questions. Uh, maybe I'll stop sharing screen first. Ooh. Was I bouncing, Chad? Sorry about that. I hope I'm in now. Okay. All right. Let me go back for some questions. Please rewind 30 seconds. Oh, shoot. Did I have a blackout? Man. I was saying I got this Wi Fi extender. I actually got fiber to the house. It's supposed to be gigabit, but the Wi-Fi extender is my weak point. Um, so I hope that there weren't too many holes. Apologies for that. So let me go to questions. If I had access to 10 times more capital, could I scale 10 times more? Not personally, no. Um, I would start trying to bring friends in <laughs> um, so that I had more partners because I can only make, you know, as, in, as I'm very asked and my typical day, you know, pre COVID was to get in my car and drive to a company that I worked there until lunch. Uh, try, I try to go all hands me and be on there all day even so that I, you know, could be as much a part of this possible. And then at lunch and go to a second company for the second and so for me, there's a limit to how many companies I can be involved in at that level. And I can't imagine investing in any other way for me. Um, Grep VC, I have a partner, Bruno Bowden, exceptionally strong technical uh, engineer as well. And so we're already at double scale from just me alone. Uh, and I'm sure that we have other friends and people that we've worked with for decades that we could pull in that's the only way that I know that I could scale. I mean, beyond that, we do follow investments out of this fund, typically within the fund, maybe only for one more round because the valuations by two rounds out, it just doesn't make sense from a math perspective. But we tend to build auxiliary funds uh, to follow further than that. And so I, I may deploy capital that way by putting money in down the road uh, from a separate fund, a separate vehicle. Do I ever invest in solo founders? I would never say never, but have I? Hmm. The fact that I'm having a hard time thinking of one, I think uh, uh, 
I don't think I've ever joined a company with a solo founder, and I don't think I've ever invested in a company with a solo founder. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, what is my biggest constraint as an investor in a COVID world? Oh, yeah, I miss going to companies and being in the companies. And I know that works at Startup uh, feels the same. The flip side side of that is it's easier than ever for me to join the all hands meeting via zoom uh, I don't have to get in my car and drive to it um, but beyond that you know I still like I I still don't consider an investment seriously without physically going to the startup uh, it's convenient that robot startups, they typically still have to have a physical space because they got to build them somewhere. Uh, some of them operate outdoors as well, so it's easy to go watch those outdoors. Uh, I, I wear a mask, don't worry. I wear a really good mask, actually. Um, but, but I do still want to go there in person. Uh, But yeah, I mean, the biggest constraint is just that I don't have as much physical in-time person with the startups before or after. Um, what is the problem with solo founders? Oh man, there's the stuff out there on it. I point to YC a lot because they they really like co-founder on a good job, I think, uh, documenting why and talking about this. And so I think they've got most of the reason is nailed in there, but um, yeah, I, th I think I'd point more to the C already documented reasons. I, I find I'm so myopic. I don't even think about why I don't do that anymore. I just don't do that, you know? <laughs> um, what makes a great roboticist? Thanks for asking. Robotics as a service is an interesting field because there's hardware in there. Uh, and if it's a company I'm interested in, that's a zipline prototype there. That's a cobalt prototype there. Uh, that's a little baby double robot next to it. But so there's hardware in all these things, but the, the hardware that's in them for the most part is either very inexpensive, like the wing, it's the inexpensive and custom, like the wing on that uh, prototype zipline is very inexpensive to build or buy, um, or like commodity and just not super expensive for a high reliability good part, like the motors on the propellers of that prototype, the airplane one, um, like the inertial reference units that they use inside, or the accelerometers, or the G units, which should, I should then just become that time. To a real, uh, that you know, to a really good roboticist, this is sort of a bucket of bolts, and they can tell the difference between a bucket of bolts. And I'm oversimplifying it, and probably some of my the founders <laughs> whose teams I'm a part of would be mad at me for saying it that way. But, but the idea being that the risk isn't in the hardware company. Um, but the other piece of a robotics as a service company is a SaaS company. And there's a whole bunch of rules around SaaS business models and SaaS P&Ls and running a SaaS company. And it's, it's very common for somebody that's strong in hardware to have come from a hardware background, like me at Boeing, right? Um, and somebody that comes from a pure hardware background might not have much SaaS experience. And similarly, somebody that comes from a pure SaaS background might not have much hardware experience. And so somebody who's got a real strength of experience in both areas is actually a pretty rare thing. Um, and on the roboticist side, you know, it's that strength in both the hardware and the software and in knowing what you could build and will be reliable and work in a reasonable amount of time and what's taking on too much hardware risk. I hope, sorry, sort of long-winded answer, but I hope it's good. Could you give some advice for those interested in working in VC? I get this one a lot. I have a bias towards venture capitalists that uh, have operating experience. I think it gives you an empathy to the startups that's difficult to get any other way. Um, and particularly if you're working with early stage startups, uh, you know, say late stage is hard also, but there, there is a personal level of suffering in early stage startups that's hard to understand unless you've done it. Um, 
And so my advice is always, you know, go work for a great stage company. Other advice uh, is find a way to invest as an angel in some great companies and develop your own angel investing track record. If you've got a great angel investing track record and you picked a company to work for that did really great, you'll start to look like a good. Now some venture capital funds, if you wanna go work for a bigger fund, um, that thing that I just, uh, uh, and some typically for founders, co-founders uh, of one of those companies that was very successful. So depending on what you're trying to do and where you're trying to, you know, you might need to be a founder company that is large. Um, there are people that end up in VC that don't have as much of an operating background and some of them quite successful too. So from, from a success perspective, I can't knock that approach. It's just a foreign one to me. And so I have a harder time speaking to the right thing to do for that. Um, Bill Bezos was a solo founder, okay. Um, CEO Wastewise, Bill Bezos, I think Jeff Bezos, yeah. Well, um, it's not to say that there aren't successful solo founders out there, um, but it is to say that I'm certainly not alone in looking for primarily a two, two co-founder situation or maybe three. Um, so more about what, what the investor is looking for, I guess, is you know how to say that in terms of the match. Would you be comfortable sharing the spreadsheet you use to evaluate each company? It's not a spreadsheet, it's a Word doc, and it literally is an outline that goes through the exact list that I put up there. It has a little bit more detail than that, more in line with what I was talking about. Um, but, you know, I was trying to be pretty transparent about it. Do I want to share that? I've debated just sharing the doc. Um, I'm not ready to go there yet, but maybe, maybe at some point I, if you publish literally your exact doc is that, uh, somebody games a presentation to look like that, even if they aren't really. I'd like to think with my operating experience, I'd be able to see that, but I give myself too much credit. How do you calculate valuation before investment? Conveniently, uh, besting startups is a marketplace. And so there's investors, a bunch of startups, and, and at the end of the day, you know, uh, there is a valuation market. It's largely tied to sort of the elements that I just went through. Uh, you know, the, like the most simplistic version you could say is that the two million run rate Series A, where somebody got there in twelve months, uh, is a thirty million dollar valuation, right? Um, thirty million post, and most companies want to buy twenty percent if they're leading a Series A. So, new money in will be six million. And the round size will be eight because there will be pro rata or something from seed investors or something like that. And that's just off the cuff, but that's pretty close to market. Um, and you can scale up or down from there. So somebody's at a million, but it only eight months. Yeah, maybe they're at a $20 million valuation. That's the classic was a million dollar AR before this, before, before this $2 million thing got started, it was 1 million. <laughs> And it was a $20 million post valuation on a $5 million round, 4 million of which came from the new investor trying to get 20% of the 20 million post, if that makes sense. So these were all just rough rules of thumb, but um, but valuation generally is, a, it's, it's about a market, it's about paying market. I'll tell you, both the startup and the investor should be aligned to hitting the market. If the startup cranks the valuation up too high, Remember, triple, triple, double, double, double. Well, the same goes for investment. So now for your next round, you're gonna have to hit the hurdles for a 3X valuation, um, which you know could be quite high. Now, they hit those really great, but for a lot of companies, if you're higher valuation than you should, and you're making it really hard to hit that 3X valuation hurdle the next round, it can make the next round difficult to raise a lot more important than valuation is living or dying. And so it's best to just come in at market. Similarly, if Esther tries to squeeze a startup down to accepting a lower valuation than market, then when the next round comes around, investors gonna say, 
well, you tripled. That's great. So we're going to triple your valuation. And that lower valuation will persist forever. And the early stage investor, particularly that squeezes a startup, will suffer for it forever in dilution, just as they will force the founders of that startup to suffer forever. So I actually think market valuation is a line from both sides more than a, a lot of people view it as anyway. Um, what are my thoughts on investing in a family or friend's company? Do I ever consider? Uh, I, I do it once in a while. So. Um, if they're in sector, that's one thing. And then they get evaluated exactly like everything that I invest in in sector. Um, if they're out of sector, uh, but it's a friend's company, uh, a different story. It's usually a small check. It's usually a, per it's a personal check if it's not in sector for the fund. Because again, I promise my investors that I will invest in certain types of companies and my friend's company doesn't count. Um, but my, my investors do not want me putting big checks down and spending a bunch of my time and focus on something they don't make money from. And I fully respect that, that opinion. Um, and I want to honor it. And so for that reason, if I do invest in friends, companies on the sides, it's usually going to be a very small check. Um, coming from a CS background, what's one thing you suggest to break out of the SAS bubble? Oh, Wow, I feel like SaaS is, or was where RAC is today, like a decade or so ago. And your capital fund back then was emergence, you know? And emergence like locked onto SaaS and really drove it hard. And then, you know, later Jason Lemkin with Saster turned it into high art uh, at the early stage as well. And uh, so I think there's a good body out there but I, I think to break out, honestly, to break out, grow faster. Grow faster, as crazy as that sounds. But figuring, figuring out a market that will buy fast and a distribution method that will get you out there fast is uh, respect. Four minutes to go. How do I look? I'm going to try to go fast. How do I look at startups where the team is working part time? Don't love it. Um, <laughs> There's an old saying that the team, particularly the co-founders, need to burn the ships. And uh, I think it goes back to some conquistador thing where some conquistador, when they came to the Americas, burned the ships so that the crew knew they were either figuring out how to make this thing work or they weren't. But there was no option back on the boats and go home comfortably. And so uh, when I see people that have day jobs on the side, unless they're like just waiting for capitalization to go do it full time, it's uh, not as attractive as, as somebody who has burned the ships. What's the ideal step and its investor? <laughs> it's a different one. You know, when I was spending my half days with those companies, I used to ask founders, like, hey, uh, is it okay? Like, I try to pay, but oh, yeah, they're like, we love having you here. You're, you're like part at the water cooler, and it's great. And uh, the it's, but we wouldn't want every investor doing it. Like we wouldn't want a team, like a room full of investors in there. So I would say there are different roles for different investors and, and different types of investors at different stages. That's actually an interesting question time. That could be a whole talk. If I don't invest in a startup, do I share with them why or share the scorecard? I do share with them exactly why. I, I, never, I, don't, I haven't shared my scorecard so far, um, although I keep scratching my head about that. What's my preference, investing in companies where I'm more hands-on or prefer to leave the founders on their own? I, you know, I like to be as helpful as founders want me to. Um, I don't want to be in the way. I don't ever, ever want to armchair quarterback. I don't ever want to tell anybody, not just founders, anybody at the company what to do. I believe that they know more about their market than me. They know more about how their solution than I do and the startup knows more about their team than I do. So if I have any advantage, it's an experience because I've seen something before. And if I cannot figure out a way to communicate that experience so that these people who have so much more domain knowledge that they can't easily communicate to me, uh, shame on me. Um, so I want to empower them to make a much better decision than I could and stay out of their way, but uh, as involved as they want. I'm almost, almost always involved in fundraising just because I did a lot of it on the operator side and I've helped a lot there. 
um, almost always involved in recruiting. And then it just depends on the company and what they want. If we're all remote, do we need an office? Investors, we are real. No. If, if you're robots and you need a factory, I don't think you need an office to show investors. I, I would want to meet an investor in person. I would do it out and I would get from a good 50 feet away from each other. Um, but uh, I would still meet in person, but I don't think you need to do that in an office. And in fact, I would recommend against doing it indoors. Uh, you just another reason my info on the networking sheet okay I think that's 34 seconds left I might just have to call it and stop I don't know if it's gonna boot us off or not <laughs> um, but should I start Adam are you here? all right hey everyone um, I think I think it will boot us off after the end of this 10 seconds. So thank you all for coming to the talk. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for speaking. And I hope you guys check out Startup Exchange via the link in the chat.